tell us, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Take heed that no man deceive you, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences. All these are the beginning of sorrows. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We're live. Apologies for the technical issues. We're in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. We've got new images today, so we're going to have to imagine it. We're going to do it the old-fashioned way. We get so used to things sometimes, it's hard to imagine. But we did have some uh, interesting diagrams today. We'll have to postpone that. And um, knowing the time, we probably won't do the prophecy update tonight. Uh, just because we got started a little late, we'll figure out a way to get that up another time. The book of Daniel chapter 9, the second part, Daniel's prayer and God's answer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for every blessing and every goodness that we have from you. We thank you, Lord, that as James taught us, every good and perfect gift comes from you, from the Father of, from the Father of lights, and in him there's no shadow of turning. We thank you, Lord, that you are consistent and you're faithful, and we ask you, Lord, to help us to be faithful in these unfaithful days Help us to be your faithful people. We ask you, Lord, that you shine your light into our hearts through your word. Just like the day that you created the light, Lord God, it, show, it, 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 it shined through the entire universe. Lord, you can make that happen in our hearts today. You can make the light shine, your word, in our hearts. And like the first day, Lord God, it brought light and it brought clarity. Let that be tonight for us, clarity and light. And we praise you that you send Jesus to be not only our propitiation, Lord God, but our Redeemer, our Savior, and our Lord. And currently, Lord, you are uh, ever-present in this, in this universe to make intercession for us. And we ask you that you help us not only to study your word, to understand it, and to apply it. Such a great and awesome prophecy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was going to grab this. I don't need it tonight. <laughs> Force of habit. Daniel chapter 9. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. Daniel chapter 9, we left last time on verse 24, on verse 24, understanding what the seven-year cycles are, seven-year cycles. Seventy weeks have been this, uh, determined or decreed for your people in your holy city. Notice that it is for the Jews. It is for the Jews, and it's for Jerusalem, for Jerusalem. To finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy one. So you are to know and discern that in, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild the Jerusalem into the Messiah, the, uh, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with the plaza, a moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And people of the prince and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war and desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until... A complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And so it was one of the amazing prophecies in all the Bible. The seven cycles, the 70 years or the 70 weeks that are determined here in verse 24. So let's break that down a little bit so we don't get anybody confused. 70 weeks in Hebrew, shaboom. It's not just seven or uh, 70, it's 70 weeks, 70 weeks, it's seven periods of seven years, 70 periods of seven years, meaning this, it, uh, a week in Hebrew uh, does not mean seven days or, or even seven years, it could be a group of sevens, a group of sevens, that's really all that word means, 
a group of sevens. And so the word Shabuam in plural, it's not just one group of seven, it's 70 groups of seven. And therefore we have 70 sets of seven years, 70 sets of seven years. I'm trying to explain it in different ways so everybody can kind of get it because sometimes different words mean something a little bit different. 70 sets or 70 periods of seven years. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Let's see how this word is used in the Bible, because it's always good to see how God uses it in other instances. Genesis 29, the study of Jacob, the story of Jacob and Leah. 29, let's look at verse 15. Genesis 29, verse 15. It's always good to back to the beginning. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, you shall therefore serve me, uh, you, should you just serve me for nothing. Tell me, what shall be your wages? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form of face. Now Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve you seven years for your daughter Rachel. Laban said, it is better, uh, it is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because he, uh, of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed, that I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob spent the night with her. Laban also said his, uh, gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter uh, Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel I've served you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, it is not, for, it's not the practice in our own palace to marry off a place. It's not the, marry, uh, the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one and we'll give you the other also for the service. You shall serve with me for another seven years. Jacob did so, completed her week and gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban also uh, gave his, uh, his maid, Bilhah, to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So there's a story, and you see how it's interchangeably. He worked seven years. Laban says, you work for a week. He says, work, work for me another week, and he worked another seven years. So the word week there, it's equivalent to seven years. And, of course, it's an interesting story. Of course, it's got a, a deceiver, Laban, who uh, tricks him. Later on, Jacob returns the favor and tricks him and, uh, with the story of the goats and the striped goats and the, and, and the animals. But anyway, we'll come back to the story because it has a, 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 a prophetic purposes and it has an interesting take. Somebody who makes a treaty for seven years. So there you have it. Seven, seven weeks or seven years is considered a week in the biblical context. Go back to Daniel. In that sense... We can consider now that the 70 weeks that are determined, according to Daniel, according to the angel, after his prayer, the angel gives him this incredible prophecy, uh, the word 70 weeks or 70 sets of seven years are going to be determined. Um, I had a graph up there, but um, you can't see it, but trust me, it was there. 490 years is the equivalent of the 70 sets of seven. So all I, all I did is multiply seven zero times seven. 70 times seven, 490 years. So that is going to be determined for Israel, for God's people, the Jewish people, and for Jerusalem. Remember, we're talking about Jerusalem because in verse 1, of chapter 9, I'm sorry, verse 2, we're talking about the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem. We're talking about the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem. So the prophecy that we're looking at here has to do with Jerusalem and is going to accomplish a few things. Let's look at what it's going to accomplish. When the 70 weeks are up, it is going to accomplish, finish the transgression, make an end of sin, make atonement for iniquity, bring everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, it's very interesting how we're looking at this because we're looking at the end of times. We're looking at God has determined 490 years, and then it'll be the end. 
Well, how does God describe the end? We would describe it, well, you know, we're going to heaven. Look how God describes it. The end for the Lord is finish sin, finish transgression, make righteousness, make atonement, make things right, and anoint the most holy place. Just think about how God looks at the end times and how we look at the end times. We look at the end times and go, well, finally, it's over. We're going to heaven. God says, no, it's not that. That is part of it. It's ending sin and making righteousness the dwelling place for God's people. So very, very different, right? We have to think of the way our Lord thinks about things. So uh, all these ideas of, you know, the kingdom of God and all the things that are coming on to, into play, it's all about bringing righteousness, right? When they ask Jesus about the kingdom, it says, don't worry about those times. Go make disciples. Teach them to all that I've commanded you so they will do all that I've said, right? It's the restoration of God back to men or man back to God. And God wants to have fellowship with men. That's the whole point of restoration. So question for you. Did any of these things happen when Jesus came and died on the cross? Did any of these things happen? Yes and no. Not totally, right? But remember, who is it for? The Jews. Okay, so think about it from the Jewish perspective. Did they finally have the end of transgression? No. Did they have uh, an end of sin? Did they anoint the most holy one? Are the visions and prophecy completed? You might make a case about, well, to make, a, to make atonement for iniquity. Did the Lord make atonement? Yes, but think about it like this. The word atonement, it's an interesting word, it's an English word. Uh, it's derived from what the scripture talks about, a sacrifice. Sacrifice brings atonement. William Tyndale coined that word. It is an English word. It's only found in English. At one meant atonement. If you had it up on the board, it'd be easier to see. At one meant atonement. What did William Tyndale think about? Well, Jesus is our propitiation. He is a sacrifice for sin. He restores the perfect relationship that we need to have with God. He makes us at one meant at one with God. That's the fellowship. The sacrifice of Jesus brings atonement. Okay. The sacrifice of Jesus brings the atonement. He makes atonement so we can be one with God, right? But you can't be one with God unless you have the sacrifice. For the most part, Israel, the Jewish people, have rejected that sacrifice. Therefore, they do not have at one -ment. unless they've come through the cross and the blood of Jesus, they don't have a, at one -ment or atonement with God. So it's not reality for most of them is still left with a future atonement that needs to be made, that needs to be done. Uh, everything that the Lord has done, okay, com he completed it on the cross, but it has not made effective to everybody yet. It has not been made effective, especially to the Jewish people. That's what we're talking about, right? He makes all these things possible. The sacrifice of Jesus is the means of atonement. It's how you get atonement with God, how you get fellowship with God. Am I, am I clear on that? It's... It's a difference, the difference between sacrifice and atonement. The atonement is at one minute, fellowship, unity with God. How do we get that? The sacrifice of Jesus brings it about. It's the means to atonement. If you don't have the sacrifice of Jesus, you don't have at one minute with God. Not yet. Until the sacrifice is accepted and believed and repented of sin, then the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, the vision and prophecy has not been completed. The book of Revelation largely has still been unfulfilled. We're still looking for the future prophecies. Now, some of it has been fulfilled, of course, the, the first few chapters, but largely still a future thing. Now, there will be people who dispute it. We talked about preterism last week that will dispute that everything was fulfilled in 7 AD. We dealt with that, how it couldn't be. Because Jesus has not yet come, he hasn't fulfilled everything, and he has not given the believers eternal rewards, he has not separated the sheep from the goats, he has not made judge between the nations, and any of those things have not happened. Therefore, we're still looking forward to that. So we're looking at future things, especially from the Jewish perspective, those things that is supposed to be completed at the 70 weeks, after 70 weeks, have not fully been completed. You can make a case that Jesus started the work, but in perspective of the Jews, they have not fully 
completed that at one minute with God. Vision and prophecy, of course. Anoint the most holy place. Well, Jerusalem is surrounded. The holy place hasn't even, it's not even erected yet in a sense of the holy of holies, right? So we still have to look at this from a future perspective. However, verse 25 says this. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So it has a starting point. Where does it begin? Where does it begin? Uh, it begins, in, uh, it's about Jerusalem, I should say. When does it begin? I'm sorry. When does it begin? It begins at the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Do we know when that happens? The answer is yes. Yes, it's Cyrus, and yes, it is not Cyrus. What do I mean by that? Let's go to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. It is about that. But remember, it's about the restoration of Jerusalem. So we're going to read very carefully and find out what exactly did Cyrus do. Chapter 1, verse 1. So very beginning. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Now was the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he sent the proclamation throughout all the kingdoms and to put it in writing, saying, Thus says the king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem. So he makes a decree about which particular part of this whole scheme is Rebuild the temple. What did uh, the prophecy of Daniel say? Restore Jerusalem. Are those two different things? Yes. So although Cyrus did complete that decree, and he sent forth that decree to happen, and Israel did go back, the Jews did go back to the land, it was to rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel, with about 50,000 Jews, go back into the land, and they began to rebuild the temple. However... Jerusalem laid very under rubble and, and still destroyed for quite a long time, even under Ezra. Uh, in Zerubbabel, they did not restore the city. They did not restore the walls. They did not restore any of these things. When did that take place? Turn to, Jer uh, turn to the book of Nehemiah. Let's go look at Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah and Ezra are one book in the Hebrew Bible. In our English Bibles, there's two books, so uh, they're right next to each other. But in the Hebrew Bible, it's one book. It's one unifying message. So we have to read it together. In the book of Nehemiah, verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hakilia, now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the, month, in the 20th year, while I was in Shusha, the capital. Now, he is in the Persian Empire. He is not serving under Cyrus. He is serving under a different king. And look at chapter 2. It tells you who the king was and it tells you when it happened. And it came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before me, uh, before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not, had not been in, uh, sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face sad? Are you sick? This is nothing but sadness in your heart. Then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be, sad, uh, not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies desolate, and its gates have been consumed by fire? So much later, after Ezra had been there, and Zerubbabel had been there, and Haggai had been there, and Zechariah had been there, the little city was still very much in rubble. Still, Nehemiah gets word from the captives from, that had gone back from the people in Jerusalem that the city was still very much desolate. And he weeps and he cries and he's sad before the king. And it tells you who the king is. Artaxerxes, in history, he was Artaxerxes Longimanus. Longimanus, if you know a little bit of Spanish or Latin, you know what that means. The long hand. He had a long hand. He had a, a specifically a long hand. Longimanus. Mano, longis, longitude, long hand. For some reason, the, uh, the Greeks and the Romans looked at him and history, and they said, well, he has a long hand. And it was his right hand that was particularly longer than the other, for some reason. Uh, so he's well known in history. Artaxerxes Longimanus. Now, there's been many other, uh, different Artaxerxes throughout history, but we know who this one is because it says 
in the 20th year, the 20th year of his reign, right? Out of all the Artaxerxes, only one reign for 20 years. The other ones reign shorter. This is the only one that reigned for more than 20 years. And so we know exactly who he is, Artaxerxes Longimanus. His reign, his kingdom, uh, from 465 to 425 B.C., from 465 to 425 B.C., roughly about 40 years, and it happened at the 20th year. So right at the middle of his reign, this event occurred. Now, it also tells you when it happened. What month was it? Nissan. The month of Nisan. You guys are very shrewd and very good biblically. The month of Nisan is, happens to be a very important feastal or festive calendar for the Jewish people. It is the Passover. That's right. So this is around the Passover. Now, when the Bible does not tell you what day it is, it is always known to be the first one. So here it says, and it came about in the month of Nisan. What day is the first? If it doesn't tell you which day, it's normally the first. So it was on the first of Nisan, and we know exactly the day because it was 445 B.C., in the 20th year of Artaxerxes Longimanus. It works better if you had a, something on the board, but you kind of have to imagine it. Um, makes you listen a little closer. <laughs> so on the 20th year, what day was that? Let's translate that into our solar calendar. It was March 14th, 445 B.C. March 14th, 445 B.C. You can write that down, write it on your hand or write it on someone's Bible. March 14th, 445 B.C. is when the 70th week of Daniel begins. Because Daniel says, when the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem is set, that is the beginning of the 70th week. Uh, so Nehemiah is talking to the king. Artaxerxes sees that it's a sad occasion, tells him why, writes a decree, sends out uh, that Nehemiah is sent out by the king with the authority of the Persian king to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem on that day, the first of Nisan, 445 B.C. We'll come back to Nisan in a moment because it's uh, quite of an interesting month. It's a very specific month. So from the time to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, March 14, 445 B.C., countdown begins. Countdown begins. Everybody all right? Everybody okay? Did I lose anybody? It's a little bit of math. But if you, uh, if you take your shoes off, you might be able to count. So, no joke. <laughs> 445 B.C., first of Nisan. Verse 25. Now, as, um, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing to the, uh, to the decree of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, very specifically, the Mashiach Nagi, Messiah the prince, will be seven weeks in 62 weeks, and it'll be built again with plaza and moat, and even in times of great distress. Well, it was a really hard time to rebuild Jerusalem. Just read the book of Nehemiah. There are all kinds of enemies, Tobiah, Sanballat. They got involved, they delayed it, and they finally had to rebuild Jerusalem, or the walls of Jerusalem, with a sword and a trowel, right? They had to fix the wall, but they had to fight the enemies. Uh, great, great chapter, Nehemiah, uh, about if you look at it from the spiritual perspective, how to build the church. It's always building up the church, but there's enemies all around. It's always a sword of the spirit, and you're building and edifying the body and make sure the breaches are, are covered and nobody gets in, the enemy doesn't get in. You're always building, but you're always on alert, right? Every, Nehemiah was a great, great um, organizer, and he set everybody up the right way and finally was able to rebuild the wall. Now, it says that there is 7 and 62. So this has confounded a lot of scholars. I'm not saying I have it all right completely, but it's confounded a lot of scholars because instead of saying 69, 62 plus 7, it says 7 and then 62. And uh, I haven't really seen many scholars who have answered this correctly. In my opinion, they're always sort of lacking answer. The only thing that we could probably say is the fact that it took... 49 years, which is really that period of seven weeks, right? Seven times seven. So seven weeks, seven periods of seven years. It took 49 years for the people to rebuild. 
for the people to rebuild not only uh, the temple and the city, it took them 49 years to finally do it. The people were involved, and you read the book of Haggai, they were involved in their own in their own houses. They were caring about their own concerns. They were doing things that Haggai and Zechariah says, get back to work. God's workers need to get back to work. And they were not doing that. So people were too consumed with themselves rather than God's work. And it took 49 years to get it going. Then, But they got it going, and they finally did it. So for 49 years, it took them that much longer to organize. But then, so it's broken up that way. Those seven weeks, those 49 years, it's the time that they needed to get organized and get ready. And then you have the 62 weeks. So you have the 62 weeks after the seven, which is 69 weeks. It's a bit confusing, but it's the way the word of God is described here. First the seven, then the 62. So let's read verse 26. Then after the 62... So that means 49 years have passed, and the rest is going to come into fruition now. Then after that, the, the next 434 years right, are going to come to pass. Uh, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. So after the 62, what's going to happen? The Messiah is going to come, and Messiah is going to be cut off. Uh, very amazing prophecy. By the way, the Jewish people are not to... There's a curse on the Jews who read this, cha this chapter. It's one of the forbidden chapters. That in Isaiah 53, uh, it is the forbidden chapter. And they ask the question, why is this chapter cursed or forbidden? Because the time of the Messiah is foretold. It is rightly foretold. And then they say, and we are not ready. We are not ready for that. And therefore, they put a curse on anybody who reads Daniel 9. Now you wonder why. Well, the reality of it is, if they just would have read it, they would have understood something. The Messiah had to come, number one, and then be cut off and have absolutely nothing before the temple was going to be destroyed. Now, this is what changed a man named, a man's heart named Leopold Cohen. Leopold Cohen was a, a Russian immigrant a Jewish-Russian immigrant who came to the States and in New York, somebody tried to hand him a New Testament. He, he flung it into a corner. He didn't want anything to do with Christianity. He has seen his people died, his parents died, his family died. But then something intrigued him. Why was this chapter cursed? If it's for our benefit, if it's for the Messiah to come, and it's for us, why is this cursed? So he asked all these questions, right? You begin to ask questions and you begin to find the answers. So he asked the question to his rabbis, why is this thing? Well, they gave him all the answers, all the Talmudic answers. He wasn't satisfied with it. He looked, and he looked at Zechariah 12, about the one who was pierced. And he asked those questions. What about him? What about the one who was pierced? And they always gave him some kind of you know, vague answer and things like that. Finally, finally they told him, well, the fact, the fact is, the rabbis have said the Messiah was to be pierced, and the Messiah had to come before the second temple was destroyed. And so there's only one person that fits that. That's Jesus, the Messiah. If that's our Messiah, then we missed him. And he repented and believed and became a pastor. And that's the beginning of Chosen People Ministries. Chosen People Ministry based in New York. It's a wonderful ministry to the Jews. But it was out of this desperation to find out why our rabbi's telling us this chapter is cursed. Why is there a curse on anybody who reads it? Well... The devil has really tried to keep people away from Jesus. And boy, he's, he's done a number on many, many people. Now, let's continue. It says, when the Messiah would come, he would be cut off. Literally, the word is to be killed for a capital punishment. It's something he did that was wrong, but it wasn't him that was wrong. The New Testament says that it wasn't for him that he was dying for or something he did wrong. It was for us. He was taking the place of criminals. He was taking the place of sinners. He died between two criminals. And it says he'll have nothing. Jesus was left alone. He was deserted. He was desolate. Exactly what the book of Daniel says. You couldn't, you couldn't describe it any other way. The Messiah would come and be cut off and have nothing. He didn't have a tomb to put, his, uh, to put the body in. People had to borrow a tomb. It was, it was borrowed for a weekend only, but uh, it was borrowed. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea. 
So it says in verse 26, when the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. When did that happen? Well, there's no doubt, and nobody argues with this. It was 70 AD, 70, 70 AD was when the Romans, under Titus Vespasian, came into Jerusalem to quelch down the continued riots that they have in the revolt, and finally they decimated the place. They, uh, they shot an arrow into the temple, started melting the gold, and literally fulfilled the prophecies of Jesus. Not one stone will be left upon another. The Romans began to take the temple, stone by stone, heaving it off the high places. You can still go down today. It's called the, uh, right by the, right, it's near the Wailing Wall or the, uh, the Cattell. It's you have all these rocks that are there, and it's the crash, right? The Wall Street crash, literally. The walls were thrown over. These massive rocks were thrown over onto the streets by the Romans. They're still there. And it was fulfilling the very words of Jesus. All of those stones would cry out. They would tell you Jesus was absolutely right. 70 AD was absolutely the destruction of the temple. It's never been rebuilt since then. And so any talk about the Messiah coming, it's complete uh, for the first time. It's complete nonsense. Because Daniel says he had to come before that event happened. And it's a tragic event. It happened around, uh, well, it, it happened on 70 AD, but on Tisha B'Av. It was the, roughly the 9th of August. It's the same day that the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. It happened on the same day. As if God was trying to tell him something. I mean, it's all there. It, 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 if people want to look into it, uh, if Jewish people want to look into it, it's all there. First temple destroyed, Tisha B'Av, by the Babylonians. Second temple, Tisha B'Av, by the Romans. But the prophecy is, before that event happened, the 70 AD, the Messiah would have to come and die before that temple was destroyed. Well, that's the prophecy. How does it work out? Well, it says that after the 62 and the 7, then, then the Messiah would come. This is where we need to... <laughs> It would come into play. We base it off a 360-day calendar. We base it off a 360-day calendar. The Bible bases off a 360-day calendar. The lunar calendar. It's based off a lunar calendar. We have more of a solar calendar, so we have, what, about 365, and every four years we had a day, right? So 365 plus one every four years. That's the solar calendar, which was changed by the Romans, and then I think Pope, Pope Gregory added some days and months. Anyway, it's, it's a, whole, a whole different kind of study. But the Bible tells us 1,260 days in the book of Revelation, three and a half years in the book of Revelation, as well as Daniel, time, times, and a half time. It's all based on 360-day calendar. So if you do the math on 1,260 days or 42 months, all works out to... The Bible operates on a 360-day calendar, 360 days. So this is one part that has to be rectified very quickly in order to find out if these things are true. Not 365, or otherwise you'll be really messed up. 360 days. So if you take the 69 periods of seven years and you multiply that out, that's 483 years. That's 483 years. Uh, in other words, 100, 173,880 days. So if you multiply by 360, right? So you take the 69 times the 7 times the 360. Sorry about the math lesson, but it works out. 483 years, in other words, 173,888 days. Why so specifically? Because God is... And if you were to take from the day that it was set to decree to restore Jerusalem, remember that day, March 14th, 445 B.C. with Nehemiah? And you add all those days or all those years, you'll come to 32 A.D. 32 A.D., April 6, 32 A.D. What happened on that day? Well, in Luke chapter 3, it gives us one interesting chapter uh, the beginning of it, it tells you exactly who was ruling, who was reigning, the beginning of Jesus, the beginning of John's ministry, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And we know from history that Jesus 
would have gone into Jerusalem on the temp, uh, into the eastern gate, through the eastern gate, on a donkey, on April 6, 32 AD. It was Triumphal Sunday. Triumphal Sunday, the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday, as they call it, is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. This is the day we call the triumphal entry. Jesus revealed himself to the um, to, to Israel, the whole Israel, to the Jewish community, to the religious leaders. And so the number of days that Daniel says from that decree till Jesus riding on a donkey fits perfectly. Fits absolutely perfectly. Now, what were they singing on that day? Let's turn to Psalm 118. It's a very beautiful psalm. It's one of the most festival, festive of all the psalms. It happens to be what they called the praise psalms. The praise psalms, 118, right before the, for Psalm 119, the big one. And they sing this song. Actually, they sing 113 through 118. We're not going to do that, but they usually would sing it. They start off, you know, the, the, the pilgrims start off near the Mount of Olives, and they come down to the Temple Mount. And by the time they get to the Eastern Gate, they're singing 118. That's how it works out there. They're singing, and they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, welcoming the king of Israel, the son of David. Uh, look at chapter, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22. Verse 22. So they're singing this all the way through, and they get to this part, which is one of the most quoted passages in the New Testament. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So they asked Jesus when he was there, uh, Jesus, your disciples are singing this psalm. Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna. And he says, you've got to make them stop. And Jesus said, well, if you make them stop, even the rocks would cry out. This day is an important day. And it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They were about to reject the very one that the psalmist said was going to come. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, do save. Hosanna. We beseech you. Oh, Lord, we beseech you. Send prosperity. Blessed is he, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is our God, and he has given us light. Can you imagine Jesus riding into Jerusalem and everybody singing that song? It would have been the kingdom. The kingdom is here. The Messiah is here. The psalm is being fulfilled. The son of David is on the donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9, that the Messiah would come riding humbly on a donkey. Everything is perfect, except that they were wanting him to fulfill the kingdom at that very moment. But Jesus said he had come. He had told them very, very several times that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die on the cross. They wanted to make him king and wanted him to get rid of the Romans without getting rid of their sins. And of course, that's man's heart for you, isn't it? We want God to make things right in our lives. We have a bad boss. We have a bad time. We have a bad situation. We want God, you fix it. And God is more interested in fixing our hearts and our sin and getting rid of those things that causes the issues rather than the issues itself. And how much of that have we been guilty of that? Lord, Get rid of my boss, get rid of this. Instead of saying, Lord, uh, get rid of my sin. Get rid of my pride. Get rid of my arrogance and my, and my gossip. And get rid of my things that, that stand between you and me. Yeah, they just want to get rid of the Romans. Get rid of my enemies, Lord. Get rid of the Democrats. Get rid of the Republicans. Right? Get rid of all these. Take a, take a, a word from Frank. Get rid of all these bums. <laughs> right? Except to say, Lord, get rid of the old man. <laughs> Help me get rid of the old man. Get rid of my old man, right? It's a great song, by the way, this psalm here. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. We sing it's a great song, but in the context, what was that day speaking of? It's the day that Jesus was going to come, right? That's the ultimate fulfillment. That day is the marvelous. It's the day which the Lord has made. But he was going to be rejected. He was going to be rejected. That's why it's, it's, it's so amazing. That prophecy right there, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. To those who accept him will become our cornerstone. To those who, um, 
to those who were rejected, that stone was there, and they completely ignored it. They put it aside. It had nothing to do with it. Now, this, of course, happened at the month of Nisan. Remember the month of Nisan with Nehemiah? It was specifically, purposely, that it was a month of Nisan. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to read what happened on that first Exodus, that first month of Nisan, where the Lord says in verse 1 that he was going to make this month, the month of Nisan, the first month of the year, first month in the calendar. Now, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, speaking of the month of Nisan, as you you keep reading chapter 12 and chapter 13, you find out that it's the month of Nisan in the context of the whole thing. We're not going to read it all, but it's referring to the month of Nisan. This month shall be the beginning of months. This is the first of the year. It should be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel. On the tenth of this month, they are to each one take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbors nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you should divide the lamb. The lamb shall be an unblemished year old male. An unblemished year old male. Uh, you ever seen a year old lamb they're not that cute and cuddly they're a little bit big they got little horns now starting to develop so uh, i know we see jesus this little lamb you know the pictures lamb that was slain um it's the it's the ram of god it's the lamb of god it's the the one who is strong he's innocent but he's mighty and strong a male a year old And you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill it at twilight. So it happened on the, now remember I told you, Nisan gives you the day. The 10th, bring it into the house. Part of the family. A male, a year old. It's supposed to be one for each family according to the number of households. If there's too small, you can combine families for that one lamb. Then on the 14th, at twilight, he is to be killed. That's exactly what happened uh, when Jesus came into, uh, came into Jerusalem. After that day, he was inspected, right? He was unblemished. He was inspected by the religious leaders. He was tried. He was brought before trials, and they found absolutely nothing. He was an unblemished lamb. And on the 14th, The 14th of Nisan, Jesus died on Passover. The Gospels are very clear. Jesus died on Passover, the 14th of Nisan, before the sun went down. Now, it was an interesting day because the sun went down twice that day, right? Remember, the sun went down at noon, fulfilling prophecy of Amos. It's a whole other story. But uh, at twilight, because the Passover was about to begin, sorry, the Sabbath was about to begin, they needed to get him off the cross very quickly. And it was twilight already. They couldn't have any dead bodies on the cross. Therefore, they accelerated the process, right? They broke all the other guys' legs, the two other ones. But when they got to Jesus, he was already dead. And they pierced him, and water and blood came out, right? And it's a beautiful story and amazing fulfillment of the book of Deuteronomy and Numbers and how the cleansing and the blood, uh, the water and the blood brings cleansing and purification. And that's what came out of our Lord. And, but it was the 14th of Nisan. So anyway, get back to the prophecy get into gospel message, but get back to the prophecy. So Jesus, no sin was found on him, absolutely unspotted, um, unblemished lamb, an amazing prophecy. He died before the second temple was destroyed. About 40 years later is when 70 AD happened, the temple was destroyed. Let's go back to Daniel, because now we, we've gone through different books already. Hopefully he's still with us. Now, remember, this is uh, essential, essential to understand prophecy. Remember, I told you from the very beginning of Daniel, it's the, it's the clearest, most easiest way to get, a, to get a grasp on prophecy. If you get Daniel, you get the other books, because it explains everything about prophecy, and uh, even some of the things in other books are related to this. So, verse 26 So the people of the print who succumb will destroy the temple and the sanctuary. Its end will come with the flood. Even to the end, there will be war and desolations that are determined. And to this day, war and desolations are determined. It has never stopped. 
one of the things that uh, Jews, uh, rabbis, and anti-missionary groups say, well, Jesus is not the Messiah because he didn't bring peace. Right? That's one of the great complaints about Jesus, is that if he was really the Messiah, he would have brought worldwide peace to the world because he is the Prince of Peace. Well, he is the Prince of Peace, but Daniel tells us here, there will be war and desolations until the end. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but he did not come to end all the wars at the beginning. He came to save us from our sin. Then he'll be the Prince of Peace to the whole world. But we have peace with God, the Apostle Paul said, through him, right? He is our peace offering. We have peace with God. He did bring peace. Not the way the world wants to give peace, right? That's what Jesus said, didn't he? I give you peace, not as the world gives. My peace I give to you, right? It's a very much a different peace that the world thinks. Um, the Bible talks about peace as you know being in peace with God. Even though all turmoils are around us, we can have peace in our own hearts and our own lives because of the relationship we have with Jesus. But let's continue. Now, question comes up. Why did it stop here? Why the 69 stops here, Right? Verse 26, after the 62, you know, the 7 and then the 62. Why not continuous? Well, there's a gap. There's a gap because seemingly Daniel doesn't say, and that's the end. He says, well, there's 70 in the beginning, verse 24, and now there's 69. So what happened to that one? Are they continuous? No, they're not continuous. Why not? Turn to the book of Acts. Turn to the book of Acts, Acts 1. They are not continuous for a very important reason. Acts 1, as Jesus with his disciples, the Mount of Olives, verse 6, when they asked him, they had come together and they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Lord, we know you're the Messiah. We didn't get it then, but we get it now. You died for us. You rose again. You truly are the Messiah. You restored. Everything you said came to pass. You are really the one. That means this, the kingdom must start now, right? Because Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the prophets said, when the Messiah would come, it will be the kingdom. And Jesus says, Verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons or the epochs for which the Father has fixed for his own authority. But you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. Why is the 69 not continuous, or the 70 not continuous? Why did it stop at 69 and they asked Jesus, is it, is it now the 70th one? That's what they were asking. Is it now going to fulfill the kingdom? Because Daniel said it was 70. We're about to enter the 70th. Nope. Don't worry about the father has it. He's got it in his hands. You go do something that has been foretold. It was a mystery. How are Gentiles going to come into the kingdom? Because there's a pause. Because there's a gap. Because the 69 and the 70 are not continuous. And uh, you can go home tonight and thank the Lord for that not being continuous. Otherwise, none of us would be here. But God has preordained that there will be Gentiles and Jews in his kingdom. And so he says, go preach the gospel. Go make disciples. Go to Jerusalem. Go to Judea. Go to Samaria. Go to the ends of the earth. So Peter and John and Paul, they all go. John and Peter go to the Jews. They, uh, remember Peter says, times of refreshment will come in if you repent. To those who are near and to those who are far off. So the nation had rejected, but a few Jews had believed. But then Jesus said, go to the nations. Go to the nations. We've been studying that in, in the book of Acts. Now, a little bit backtrack from Acts. Let's go to Matthew 23. But is it at some point going to be fulfilled? The 70th, is it going to at some point be fulfilled? Yes. Matthew 23 tells us what will be or what will happen uh, when this is fulfilled. Matthew 23, verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, we're still talking about Jerusalem. Jesus says, who kills the prophet, stones those who are sent to her. This is right after the triumphal entry. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers his ch her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until 
You say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Just like Psalm 118. We're going to do Psalm 118 again, but it'll be under different conditions. When you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, when you're desperate and you need the Messiah to save you, then the Lord will come for them. It'll come during the 70th week of Daniel. There is, there is a coming one. There is a coming fulfillment of it, but we're still in that gap. Now, people had asked me about the gaps. Are there other gaps in the Bible? How much time we have? Oh, we got plenty of time. We're not doing an update anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, we do have other gaps. Let's turn to the book of, uh, the book of Matthew. Matthew or Luke? No, let's go to, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 4. I like Luke's account. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Would somebody want to read Luke chapter 4? And I'll tell you which one. Verse 14 through 19. 14 through 19. Nice and loud for all of God's people to hear it. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and uh, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. Then he says he closed the book, gave it back to the attendants, and everybody was looking at him. By the way, it would have been uh, it would have been a perfect day to do it because uh, they they do it in cycles, right? They read in cycles. They read a portion of the Torah and a portion of the prophets, and it just so happened that day, this passage was going to be read. Now we know exactly where this is where this is from. This is from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter sixty one. So you heard Keith. I'm going to read what Isaiah said in verse one: "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me." Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. All, everything true. And the day of vengeance of our God. Wait a minute, Jesus. He did not quote the full verse. He left. The, he stopped. Why did he stop? Remember, one Messiah, two comings. First coming, he brings all those things that we read. Uh, he's anointed to preach the gospel, proclaim liberty, liberty, recovery to the, uh, to the blind, uh, sight to the blind, free to those who are oppressed, freedom to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. It's when the Lord, God's favor is upon us. His mercy is upon us. It's a favorable year. He would restore us. He would bring us back to himself. And we would have his mercy. And then that gap. And then the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus did not quote that because that's, that part of the verse doesn't happen until Revelation chapter 6. When they said, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb, the orge. The orge of God is coming upon a Christ-rejecting, sinful world, the kingdom of Antichrist will receive the wrath of God, the wrath of Jesus. And so he's going to come and bring that, but there's a gap. How long did that gap has, 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 has lasted? How long has it lasted? About 2,000 years. It's a big gap. Let's go to another gap. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Book of Ezekiel chapter 8. Book of Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel's a fascinating book. We should be more on it than ever before. It's making a lot more sense now than when I first read it. It came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, I was sitting in the house with the elders of Judah, sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell on me there. And I looked in likeness of an appearance as a man from his loins downward. There was the appearance of fire and his loins upward, appearance of brightness, like the appearance of a glowing metal. And he stretched form, stretched out the form out of a hand, out of, uh, 
form of a hand and caught me by the lockhead. And the spirit lifted me between heaven and earth and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. In the entrance of the north gate to the inner court where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy, was located. And behold, the glory of the Lord God of Israel was there, like the appearance which I saw in the plains. And he told me, Son of man, raise your eyes now to the north. So I raised my eyes to the north, and behold, to the north of the altar gate was the idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel committing, so that would be far from my uh, here, so that I would be far from my sanctuary, but yet you will still see greater abominations. Literally, they were worshiping idols. They were worshiping terrible, uh, terrible gods and different idols in the house of the Lord, in the temple of God. And yet there was going to be more abominations is to come. So uh, I'm going to delay you. The, 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 I'm not going to go through every chapter in this, but chapter 8 through 11, very critical part of Ezekiel. What I want to get to is this. God says, now there's going to be judgment. They've gone too far. They've gone too far, and now there's going to be judgment but there's going to be something that's going to happen. Uh, verse 10. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall and all around. And standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jazaniah, the son of Zava, standing among them, each man with a censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of the incense rising. So 70 elders, just like in the time of Moses, but they had gone completely apostate. They have now been worshiping false idols, abominations in the house of the Lord. And yet more was going to come. And the Lord says, that's it. It's going to come. But I want you to do something. Look at chapter 9, verse 4. The Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city and even through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But to the others, he said, in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. So God was going to come and he was going to bring the executioners. Judgment was going to come. Remember, Babylon was going to just completely obliterate the place. And Ezekiel says, well, before that judgment happens, I want you to go and I want you to mark those who groan, those who are distressed, those who sigh and groan over regarding all the abominations. And God says, put a mark on them. And the, literally in the, in the Hebrew, it's the word tav, tav, T-A-V. And if you look at ancient Hebrew, uh, look it up, and it's the form of a sideways cross. Uh, it looks like an X, but it's a sideways cross. That's the way the T-shape, it was a T-shape, was written in ancient Hebrew. Now it's a little bit different. So if you look at modern Hebrew, you'd be like, well, what is he talking about? You got to look at the ancient Hebrew, because this is what's written in ancient Hebrew. And it was the letter Tav. It was a slanted cross, sideways cross. It was, of course, the letter Tav it was a mark on the foreheads, on the foreheads of God's men, of God's people. Those who mourn, those who were not going along with what was happening in the temple. Now remember, the temple in the New Testament, uh, the temple is not a physical building. The temple is the body of Christ, the church. Uh, same things are happening today. There's abominations in the temples. There's abomination in the house of God, the temple of God, the oikos hegios, right? The holy place of God has abominations. All kinds of sort of ecumenism and everything has come into the past. And people are going around and groaning and sighing. And, and God says, well, there will be judgment. Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. But before that, I need you to mark everybody that is sighing and groaning and of all the abominations that is happening. And then judgment comes. Turn to chapter 11 of Ezekiel. Then judgment comes, but something happens to Ezekiel. Verse 11, 11, 11. The city will not be a pot for you, nor for your flesh in the midst of it, but I will judge uh, I will judge you to the border of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor have executed my ordinances. You have acted according to the ordinances of the nations around, us, around you. Now it came about that I prophesied that Pelatia, the son of Beniah, died. Then I fell on my face and cried out with a loud voice, Alas, O Lord, would you bring the remnant of Israel to a complete end? So the judgment did come. Ezekiel was there. But God had mercy on Ezekiel. Why? In verse 1 of that chapter 11... 
It says, moreover, the spirit lifted me up. It brought me to the east gate of the house of the Lord. Ezekiel has an experience that God lifts him up. He knows the judgment's coming. He, of course, knows about it later. But during this time, he's lifted up and he's taken out of the way before the judgment comes severely upon Jerusalem. Now, all that to say, and, and I miss uh, in chapter 10, there's the glory of the Lord that departs. We didn't talk about that. That's a longer one. Uh, the glory of the Lord departs. The glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, goes further and further east until it leaves. Chapter 10, verse 4, the glory of the Lord departed. It was literally the fulfillment of Ichabod. The glory has departed. So all these things are happening, and God marks his people, saves them, and rescues them, and takes them out of the way. What does that sound like to you? Yeah. Is that interesting? Well, also, but there's a, there's, okay, that's the gap, right? Judgment's coming. Wait, don't do it yet. Go mark everybody that's right. Then the judgment will come. Then I'm going to rescue you out of there. Sounds like Revelation chapter 7, isn't it? Judgment's coming. The wrath of the Lamb is about to come. God says, hold up. The angel says, wait, don't harm anything until the servants of God are marked. And it puts a, a mark on the foreheads of 144,000. And 144,000 are kept from the wrath of God. Then chapter 8, right, 7 is like a, a pause. There's a gap. It's not continuous. The wrath doesn't start right away. It pauses. There's people in heaven, cut up into heaven. It says they come out of the great tribulation in the book of uh, Revelation 7. Just like Ezekiel, somebody gets cut up. Believers are cut up. Chapter 8 comes, the wrath. Just like Ezekiel. It's coming. Abominations. Don't mark everybody. Ezekiel, I'm going to take you up. <laughs> then the judgment comes. Just like that. So we have to understand Revelation 7 in light of Ezekiel. Same thing happens to Ezekiel. But there's another gap. Another gap. Uh, there's several, but let's pick another one. 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6 tells us that when Solomon rebuilt the or built the temple, he says that the children of Israel had been out of Egypt for 480 years. For 400 years. And 80 years. It came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. In the month of Zeb, second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. He begins when Israel had been out 480 years. Now, this has caused a lot of controversy, by the way. The Septuagint says 450 years. Uh, if you look at Stephen's, Stephen's account, Stephen has a different number. He says 400 years in the book of Acts. So it's caused a lot of controversy because historians have said, well, it wasn't 480 years, excuse me. It wasn't 480 years since they came out of Egypt. If you do the math, it was roughly about 570 years. The day they came out, Moses goes into the wilderness, right, with the children of Israel. Then Joshua takes over, then they go into the land. Then you got the period of the judges, and you add all these things, it's 500 and some, 70, 70, some years. You're like, how did, how did, how did the Bible get this? I'm not saying uh, Solomon said it, but the writer of Kings said it's 480 years. Is it a mistake? <laughs> no mistake, right? Now, the Septuagint has a different number. Stephen has a different number. They all, they all talk about a certain aspect of that period of time. Well, during the book of Judges, we have these events. We talk about Samson on Sunday. These events were children of Israel, seven cycles. They would, they would sin grievously. God will hand them over to their enemies. Then they would cry out to God, and then God would raise up a savior, a redeemer, and he would fight for them and deliver them and then bring them back into freedom, all to do it over again seven times. Samson was one of them. Samuel becomes the last judge. Well, if you were to add all those years <laughs> that they were in captivity under the Midianites, under those uh, Amalekites, then you would come up with the fact that, yes, about 96 years, 96 years they were in some form of captivity under their enemies. Now, they were, out in, they were still in the land, but under the oppression of their enemies. There's a gap but God says, I only recognize 480 years. It's no mistake. It's as if those years were never truly 
happened. The years that the children of Israel backslid and completely ignored God and, and went into captivity with their enemies, God says, I don't count them. You've only been gone 480 years from, Israel, from Egypt, right? Um, the time Israel was unfaithful and ruled by, all, ruled by other nations, it's almost like the prophetic time clock stopped. He waited until they got out of the land or out of the oppression, started again. When they're in freedom, God counts it. When they're under oppression, God doesn't count. Now, how does that apply to us? I believe in the same way. I believe if when we backslid, if you backslid, and if you have, then those years that are wasted, those years that are absolutely wasted, God doesn't recognize them when you fell away. So if you came back and repented, God says, what years? What years? You've only been saved three. <laughs> you know, we stunt our growth. Don't get me wrong. It's not good. I'm not saying, well, I'm just going to backslide. God doesn't count them. No, it's not good. You're still an immature Christian. You're still, and there's no successful backslider. There's nothing like that. It, it's always going to be a hard road. It's always going to be a difficult thing. But God in his mercy, he will not recognize those years. It's almost like if we're just brand new believers again. <laughs> and I don't want to do it again. I don't want to go through that again. But God, at certain point doesn't count those years that Israel backslid. He wouldn't do it for us either. I believe God will restore those things that the locusts have eaten, says the book of Joel. So we begin anew with the Lord. Israel came back, they begin anew. And that's why the book of Kings says, hey, it's only been 480 years. They've been gone longer from Egypt. But part of those were very difficult years. Part of that were in the oppression of the enemy. Let's go back to Daniel. Let's finish this off. Finally, right? I didn't hear a complaint, so that was good. All right. Not until tomorrow. So what do we call this period? We call this period the fullness or the times of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles have to do with the period of time, this gap, where God for 2,000 years has brought in salvation to the Gentiles. And Book of Romans, which I had a slide for that. I keep forgetting <laughs> Uh, I keep wanting to look back for some reason. The book of Romans says that Israel will come back. A partial hardening has happened to them, but Israel will come back. God's uh, hardening and blindness is only temporary until, I don't want you to be ignorant or uninformed, brethren, of the mystery, so that you will not be wise on your own estimation that a partial hardening and has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It's talking about the salvation of Gentiles into the olive tree. Uh, when God has determined that and it's finished, then God restores back, goes back to Israel, goes back to the 70th week of Daniel in a sense, goes back to dealing with Israel as it were the other 69 weeks. Now, the times of the Gentiles is slightly a little bit different. Jesus talked about the times of the Gentiles, and that has to do with Jerusalem. That has to do with Jerusalem. So the fullness of the Gentile salvation to the Gentile world, the fullness of the Gentile has to do with Jerusalem and being trampled under the foot of the Gentiles, has to do with the reign of Antichrist, has to do with the 42 months in which the Antichrist will have power and control over Jerusalem and will be trampling the foot under their foot, under the feet of the Gentiles. Yes, Steph, yes Frank. Yes, Yes, correct. Correct. We're still in that. We're still in that. And so lots of things, right? Lots of this, this gap is it's actually the biggest gap in the Bible. All the other gaps have been rather short, uh, but this is actually the biggest one. It's the church age where God has brought in salvation, but also what's happened to Jerusalem. It's been under the foot of the Gentiles, even till now. Uh, it'll have its concluding fulfillment in Revelation 11, because the, actually the Antichrist will have control of Jerusalem. And we'll, uh, remember John doesn't measure a part of the temple has been given over to the Gentiles. Uh, that has to do with the trampling of Jerusalem under the feet of the Gentiles. But we got to finish verse 27. Because is this ever going to start again? The answer is yes. We've seen that. But when does it start again? Verse 27. And he, that is the previous one, the previous he, is the prince of the people who is to come. 
right? He will make a firm covenant with the many, speaking of the Jews, for one week. There is your seven-year period remaining. But in the middle of that week, so based on a 360-day calendar, that's three and a half years. This is the most no. Uh, this is the number that is used the most in the Book of Revelation. Uh, it doesn't use the seven years. It uses the three and a half, right? 42 months, 1,260 days, time, times, and a half time. Good? Okay. I don't want to confuse everybody, but just these are terminology. They all mean slightly different things. It's the same period of time, but from a different perspective. Like 42 months has to do with the Antichrist, uh, time, times, and a half time, 1,260 days. They're the same time period, but they, they refer to a different aspect of it, just a different angle. For one week, and in the middle of that week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations, he will cause, uh, will come one who makes desolate. So the Antichrist, and I told you last time that in reform circles, this is referring to Jesus. I don't think it is. I, I, I vehemently disagree. Jesus never made a seven-year covenant with anybody. Uh, the three and a half years, yes, that relates to the ministry of Jesus. It's, it's, it's similar, but it's because the Antichrist is going to want or mimic the same thing that Jesus did. Jesus had three and a half years of ministry. He's going to want three and a half years of ministry, right? Now, God's going to give him three and a half years of ministry, but he's going to cut it short. More of that later. Uh, that is an important part. It's to determine who this prince is, right? Whoever he is, he's going to make a covenant with the Jews, and he is going to cut or he's going to confirm and he's going to put a stop he's going to put a stop to the sacrifice meaning at some point they have started at some point they started right if something is stopped that means at a previous time I'm not trying to be facetious but just at some a previous time it started then he makes a stop and then he says and on the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate it's again the abomination of desolation. Now it's quite clear that it's not Jesus. Jesus did not come to make desolate. He did not come to make an abomination of desolation. Uh, one thing for sure, look at Revelation 17. Look at Revelation 17. We're all over the Bible today, but we're trying to tie everything together. It's one message, right? One message, many books. Revelation 17, 11, speaking of the beast, it says, the beast which was and is not, is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. Now the beast who was, remember the description of Jesus and the Father in the book of Revelation chapter 1? The one who is, who was, and who is to come, right? The beast is trying to be like Jesus, but he can't because Jesus is eternal. He's not. He's a man possessed by Satan. The beast who was, and everybody's astonished at the beast. They think he's the best thing. He's marvelous. He's amazing. The beast who was, and is not. <laughs> right? Jesus has never been not. Right? Jesus is the God who was, who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. The beast who was, and it's not. And look at his future. He goes to destruction. He tries to be like Christ. He tries to imitate Christ, but he won't be able to duplicate Christ he is not because he's not eternal. And so the one who makes desolate, 2 Thessalonians, please, just to finish off, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. What is this one who makes desolate? Well, it's, it's brought up here in, in, uh, in Daniel. We talked a little bit about it last week, about the abomination of desolation that continues. But there's one that's coming, 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. So it's talking about the, uh, the gathering, the coming of the Lord and the gathering of his people to himself. Verse 1, let no one deceive you. For that day, the day of the Lord and the day of his coming, the day that he gathers his people. And one way, the day of the Lord is the judgment on, uh, on, 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 on the kingdom of Antichrist. But it's also the day that he gathers his people. The coming of the Lord and our gathering to him. Let no man in any way deceive you. For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. 
And this is the abomination of desolation, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God of object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that I was still with you? I was telling you these things. So Paul had told the Thessalonians quite a bit about it. So the abomination of desolation, you look back at what uh, Antiochus did. In 168 BC, he made a statue of Zeus, put a statue of Zeus, made facial features of himself on the temple, on the Holy of Holies, desecrated a pig on the altar, killed a pig on the altar, put the blood on it. It's the whole story of Hanukkah. That was the abomination of desolation. Jesus says it'll happen again. Look, look to that. And Paul says this is how it's going to look. He's going to go into the temple of God, and he is going to proclaim himself to be God. Daniel says he'll make a covenant. The final week, the 70th week, is the last part. It's the last of the last days. The last of the last days. We've been living in the last days, but this is the last of the last days. In the middle of that, he will go into the temple, and he will make himself God in the temple of God. And he will stop the offerings. He will stop the sacrifices. And it says he confirms. The word is gabor, to strengthen. You know, like El, El Gabor, like God. It, he strengthens the covenant. He enforces it, uh, this covenant, for seven years. And in the middle of it, he makes the stop. He makes a stop to the sacrifices. So peaceful at first. Then in the middle, he breaks everything. In the middle point, according to Jesus... And according to the book of Revelation, the middle point is the great tribulation. Matthew 24, 15. The great tribulation will begin at the abomination of desolation. That's the middle point. That's why it's such a critical moment in the 70th week of Daniel. It's the key moment in Revelation. It's the key moment in Matthew 24. It's the key moment to Paul in his epistle to the Thessalonians to say, when you see that, that's the middle. Great tribulation. But then the Lord cuts it short, doesn't he? It says, but for the sake of the elect, he cuts it short. It doesn't last that three and a half years that the Antichrist wants to rule. It cuts it short because of God's promises to the body of Christ and to believers that he will rescue them. And that's what we see the believers in heaven shortly after that in Revelation 7. And so we are living in this gap. Amen. We are living in this gap. Daniel said, 70th week, 70 weeks will be fulfilled. 69 have passed. They're fulfilled exactly. That one is left. And I have no doubt it will be fulfilled exactly. Exactly as the Bible says in Thessalonians, as Jesus said it, as Revelation says it, it will fill exactly that. All the other passages that we read figures that, right? But I did tell you about Genesis 29, didn't I? That we'll come back to that. You don't have to turn to it. Um, Laban makes a covenant with Jacob for seven years. He does it twice, but seven years. The first one. And he breaks the covenant, right? Instead of giving her Rachel, he gives her Leah. Then Jacob returns the favor and kind of outsmarts him with the, 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 the animals. But Laban is an interesting guy. He is like the picture of Antichrist. It's a symbol of what he will do. Jacob is the picture of Israel. Enters into a relationship with them and a covenant. And he breaks it. Interesting, right? There it is. Now there's more to Laban than that. His name means white. Laban, white. Book of Revelation says there's a man that comes like Jesus. He comes in a white horse. Laban, a white one. Just like Jesus has his people coming, right, Horse, in, in horses, right, we come with Christ. Well, the Antichrist has his own horsemen, right? The, right after that comes the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, so anyway, it, it fulfills everything according to Scripture, the white. And, of course, we have the white horse in Revelation. We have the white horse in the book of Zechariah. Uh, there's a famine involved in the book of Zechariah. There's a famine involved in the book of Revelation, right? So all these things are part and parcel of what's going to happen. Uh, it's always been my opinion that the Antichrist will take advantage of a very, very difficult time in the world, crucial time in the world, filled with famines and uncertainties, and he will, came, he will gain power because of that. That's how Herod got in. Just read the book of uh, Acts chapter 12. That's how Hitler got in. That's how Napoleon got in. 
There was always a spirit of Antichrist operating in the world through difficult things and, and cataclysmic things, and it looks like nothing's good come out of it, and then out of that rises a man who wants to take power and control over the whole world. And the Bible says it will happen. There is a fulfillment of this. So all these things teaches us, but there's end to it. There's a gap. Thank God for the gap, and we're still living in that gap. And no one knows when that gap is going to be closed. Because I don't know when that 70th week is going to get started, but I see that it's going to happen soon, my opinion of it. You see Jews, I, we didn't have time to the update tonight, but you see the Jews wanting, chanting, claiming for Messiah to come. The temple's at risk, the temple's at stake. Uh, you've seen our president doing all these accords, the Abraham Accord. Can you imagine the Abraham Accord? Out of all things, they call it the Abrahamic Accord. Um, and yet, the U.S. is in the balance today. You know, is he going to continue? Is President Trump going to continue? Is Biden going to step in? Uh, Israel's playing both sides, I think. <laughs> Although they have invited Biden, they also know that Biden it means war in the Middle East. Uh, so what's going to happen? I don't know. Well, Iran's moving very close. Look what happened in Tur with Turkey. They're moving very close. So is Russia. So is Turkey. We could see Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 happening soon. Yes, brother. Has Israel started being sacrificed? No, not yet. So that has not happened. That's right. That's the key. That's the key. I think a lot of, while we see a lot of political maneuvering and uh, shenanigans within politics, right, um, don't miss that part, which our brother just said. When you see the sacrifices, then start the countdown. But that's the key part. That's going to be the key, key event. Well, most people are looking for peace, and I don't deny that these are things setting up for it. Because who's involved in all this are the religious leaders. In fact, uh, Yehuda Glick, the Temple Institute uh, rabbi, he's gone up to the temple to pray for the U.S. president. Which one do you think he was praying for? Yeah. Is it interesting, huh? Um, I'm not saying anything, what he meant by it or anything like that, but that's what he said. So anyway, let's pray. Let's pray and we can close that in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. There's so much. And I pray, Lord God, we, we, we explain it the way you would have us to know it. It's your word. You'll make it come to pass. We can't make it come to pass. You are in complete control to make this happen. But you have given us a window into your word, a window into time. We can see, we can see what Jesus said about the time that you have placed in the Father's hands. Lord, I thank you that this gap has meant the salvation of so many Gentiles. So many of us, Lord, through this gap have been privileged and honored to be your children, to become your friend, to be forgiven of our sins. And we thank you for this gap, Lord God, that you have had mercy because you have preordained that there will be in the body of Christ, Jew and Gentiles. And Lord, you'll come back. You said you will. And it'll be under times of great distress upon the world. And Lord, we know and we believe that that time is getting very, very close. And Lord, we don't prepare by knowing a date. We prepare by being holy and being righteous in your sight. So make us that, Lord God. He who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.